Welcome to the Roswell Business Podcast. Today we speak with John LeMay, learning about him, his businesses, and wise words to live by. Enjoy. Well, John, uh, I certainly appreciate you being here with us today, a chance to uh, go behind the curtain and learn a little bit about you. Uh, for those of you listening, this is John LeMay. He's an author, writer, historian, uh, lives here in Roswell, does a lot for our community over the years. I've watched him and um, this is a, uh, as always, anybody we have on, it's a special treat to be able to just hear about who they are and uh, where they're headed, their, their business exploits, and then, uh, stay through to the end because that's where we talk a lot about the tips and tricks and just wisdom that they have uh, in business leadership whatever those things that they want to talk on so uh let's get let's get into that um tell us a little bit again john uh, who are you what makes you tick what uh, what's what's there sure well i was born in roswell my parents were born in roswell one of my grandparents was born in roswell and then the other ones are kind of from fort sumner in colorado so i'm pretty local i've never left roswell um, I've never been one that I want to get away. I, I actually like this town. I like uh, that it only takes about 10 or 20 minutes to get across town. I can't imagine yeah. living in a big city where it takes you 40 minutes to drive to the gym. You know, I'm, I'm happy here, you know, so I, I like Roswell and I'm, I'm glad to still be here. So one of your uh, uh, key things, you just pointed it out there, um, being able to have gym access yeah. is a huge <laughs> part of your life. Yeah. Right, right now it's about four minutes to the gym. That's pretty nice. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's talk about that. How, how frequently do you, uh, do you train? I already know a little bit of the answer, but yeah. I know a lot of people don't. Well, I used to actually have to work. My dad and I owned a mobile home park or my dad owned the mobile home park, I should say. And I would do a lot of push mowing and just physical labor and I could pretty much eat whatever I wanted, but anymore, all I do is books now. So I sit and I write, so I, I have to go to the gym and get some movement in for my mental stamina because it'll drive yeah. me nuts to sit there all day and it's just that way I don't get too overweight. I mean, Christmas hit kind of hard this year, but <laughs> I'm working on it, you know? So uh, um, we'll sidetrack, we'll chase a little bunny trail here. Um, since that's been a serious part of your life and I know uh, from in previous conversations with you, um, where do you rank uh, just health and living choices and things like mm -hmm. that in the value of your successes? Well, I, I feel like I'm a realist. You know, if I were to ever write a book on fitness, it would be that you will never have the magazine cover body, which is what everybody always promises. I would say you can have uh, a medium range of fitness that's, you know, good for a healthy, normal life. You know, I yeah. mean, to look like that, you have to do that every day and it's basically your full job. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not. Why is it important to you? I I don't like to. Hmm. If I feel overweight, it actually makes me antsy. Like I don't okay. like to sit there and just feel it. I like to to be at a in a certain weight range, or, or it just bugs me. Okay. You know, and I I think some people get the idea that because I lift weights, I'm obsessed with being big. It's not that. It's the more weights you lift, the more you can eat and get away with it. Okay. I mean, really, I'd, I'd be happy with just a nice trim physique, but um, I've, I've found for me personally, it's easier that the more muscle you have, the more you can eat and get away with it. So okay. it's, it's not like a size thing. It's yeah. more of just this, this is the easiest way for me to live. And I think that cardio is really, really boring. Okay. That's hard for me. Yeah. That, that, that's your uh, stopping yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, well, I, I love the phrase that you just presented. Uh, I like to eat. Yeah. So I'm going to train hard so I can Who eat doesn't? more. Yeah. Who doesn't like uh, to eat? That's nice. Yeah. So uh, let's go back. You said that uh, Roswell's been a huge part of that. You made a statement. Uh, you really like Roswell. Um, uh, it's refreshing to hear that. A lot of people that grow up and come from small towns, you usually have the polar opposites. Yeah. You have those that love it and those that hate it. So what what is it that you love what's what's the charm that uh, speaks to you i'm sure part of it is i just don't know any better because i've never lived anywhere else but okay. i have visited other places and i have to say i and seeing what they have to offer i like just the reliability of roswell i know what to expect and again it's not a big overwhelming town i like that 
Um, at this point, you know, I've gotten really entrenched in Roswell's history, and I would wager that Roswell has a more interesting history than just about anywhere. I mean, where else do you have an alien crash? You've got Billy the Kid, you've got Robert H. Goddard, so many different facets of history in one place. I think it's pretty unusual. Yeah. Um, I mean, for instance, I went to Salem, Massachusetts uh, this past fall, and, you know, their, their whole thing is the witch trials and their shipping yards, and I mean, that's about it. Okay. You know, and I'm, and I, we're the same thing. We're known predominantly for the aliens, but if you stick around, you'll find there's a lot more to look into here. Nice. So um, we'll, we'll transition into that. You, you Nice segue there. Um, you've spent a lot of your life really focused on uh, the local history mm -hmm. and the lore, both facts and fiction and all of that and how it all ties together and all that. Um, what is it that interests you into that? Why, why is this such a passion? Well, when I was a kid, I liked to write. I would write my own picture books and draw the illustrations. And then I uh, kind of grew out of that for a while. And school, unfortunately, I think makes it to where kids hate to write because you're forced to write a paper on something that you're just not interested in or, or whatever. And kids get to wow, where they hate good. writing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you mentioned Kate Davis earlier. Kate was my English teacher at college and at NMUR. Oh, wow. I and, never knew that. Yeah. And Kate let me, or she let everybody choose a big research topic. She didn't tell us you have to write a paper on this. She let us pick something that interested us. And I, I picked the really off the wall topic of remnant dinosaurs like the Loch Ness Monster and stuff like that. And I wrote a big, huge report on it and I loved it. I had so much fun because I could finally write about something that interested me. So uh, I do a, attribute some of my uh, my renewal and the interest of writing to Kate because wow. I, I had so much fun in her class. And then I think the fact that I had fun writing it showed because I got a really good grade on the paper and that encouraged me. And so I, I discovered that I would like to write kind of as a little hobby part of the time. And I, I found a, a website online called My Strange New Mexico, where a guy would write about just odd New Mexico lore. And I would send him little emails and odd tidbits of history that I knew. And that led to him asking me to write the Roswell portion of his website. Okay. And that then led to uh, my first book, which was the Arcadia Images of Amer America Roswell book. Okay. What does that mean to the those of us that don't understand the word Arcadia? Sure. So Arcadia, <laughs> um, so this is what's really funny about Arcadia is people will say, oh, did you write a book about wherever they're from? Because I've seen a book and it's got a cover just like this. And they sometimes think I wrote it. And I said, no, it's that's just a series. So Arcadia specializes in vintage uh, photo histories of uh, they, they just get authors to write a very basic history of their town or a certain place. Okay. And you just get as many vintage photographs as you constantly, as you possibly can. And, you know, the people don't really buy that book because I wrote it. They buy it because they like the pictures, you okay. know. And so Arcadia knows, I mean, that's probably why they took a chance on someone who had never written a book before. They knew the pictures are going to sell this book. It really doesn't matter how well he can write. And if he can't write, we can edit it. You know, I think yeah, that's yeah. kind of their mindset. So they're a, a great way to break into that business because they're very easy and, and Arcadia knows their racket. They, they do it very well and they're okay. very successful. So yeah, all across America, if you see these books with these sepia tinted covers, that's probably an Arcadia book. Got it. So you, you started out with that. Did you have some decent attention because of that? Yes. Um, I went to the historical society. That's how I became involved with them. You know, I'd never really went there very often aside from the fourth grade school tours when I was a kid. That was probably the last time I'd been there. And uh, they were very gracious there. Roger Burnett was very gracious. Elvis Fleming was very gracious in helping me. Because the truth of the matter is, if Arcadia knew better, they would have asked Elvis Fleming to write their book, and he probably would have. Interesting. But it's a case of it's not what you know, it's who you know. Yeah. And, and my friend that I was talking about who ran the New Mexico website, he wrote a book for them on the Sandia Mountains because he's from Albuquerque and he just knew that they wanted someone to do Roswell. And so he just pointed them to me. And it was funny because I really didn't know Roswell's history at the time. I didn't even know why they called Lee Street, Lee Street. Okay. You know, that's how bad it was. And uh, I went to Elvis and the, the archives and he helped me scan the photos and pointed me in the right direction of what to look at, to learn. And um, so he was very gracious, you know, very... Um, very humble man. You know, he's not an egotistical territorial. This is mine. You can't write about that. Yeah. You know, he was very generous. 
you know. So. Yeah. Um, for those that watching that may not know, I didn't know a lot of that history mm -hmm. either. And there's and there's a lot of even though I grew up here that I'm still missing. But I had the privilege of working on a short mm -hmm. film for you guys at the Historical Society a while back. And we had we got the honor mm -hmm. to film Elvis, yeah. uh, who's passed away now. But uh, being able to hear some of that, and that was my first introduction mm -hmm. too. And how cool that you yeah. got to work closely with him. Yep. Yeah. So, so you did. Uh, uh, what what all did you do for this historical society? I know that you kind of you, you referenced that you spent some time with mm -hmm. Elvis, but you did some some decent work for them too. What ended up happening is the first book I actually paid for the images because uh, you know you don't you don't get images for free that's how archives run is you pay for the images and um i wanted to do a second book so bad uh, but i didn't want to pay for the images again i mean it, it was a good investment i got a big return you okay. know so it's not like it it hurt me financially i i did see a return on that but i wanted to do another one but i was like gosh i don't know if this one will sell as well um because it was going to be on the county which is not as recognizable as roswell the town so I went to the Historical Society board and I asked them, can we do a royalty split? I get half the royalties, you get half the royalties, you know, and I write the book and do all the work. And they said, yes. So that was my introduction to the board. And uh, Elvis by then had gotten to know me well enough that he didn't babysit me, so to speak. Okay. He just let me go into the archives and do my own thing. And I was, I wouldn't call myself a volunteer at that point, I, if someone needed help and I knew how to help them, I would help them. But predominantly, I was in the archive one day a week to, to work on my Chavez County book. But I learned a lot about the archives in the process. That's pretty cool that yeah. he honored you like that to give yeah. you that respect. And yeah, he's, like I said, he's a very, uh, you know, very humble, uh, like again, not territorial, you know, very, very nice man. And somehow, you know, that, that kind of got to the board and somebody nominated me to be on the board of directors. And I was very honored, but I also wasn't naive. I knew it, it probably wasn't just because I wrote books. It was because they knew I was young and I could help them move things. And that's important. You know, that's sure. really, really important with a museum <laughs> is moving stuff around and getting right. people you can trust not to break it. And so that's how I ended up getting on the, the board of directors. Okay. And I've uh, been on there off and on just because, thank God they have it in the bylaws. You have to take a break if you serve so nice. many terms, which is really nice. I yeah. mean, because no matter how much you love it, you do need a break eventually. So yeah, off and on for the past 10 years, I've been hanging around the wow. historical museum. That's incredible. Yeah. That's really cool. So how many, uh, how many books do you have out now? And by the way, I want you to reference not just about mm -hmm. Roswell. You've got some other mm -hmm. things that are sitting out there too. Yeah, I, I, I have about three different genres, I guess, or subjects I write about. Um, I was 22 when I wrote the Roswell book. I'm 34 now. And at some point this year, I'll publish my 20th book. Wow. So that's, wow. that's how many I've gotten done. Uh, but not all of them are big, huge books. You know, again, the Arcadias are photo histories and some of them are fairly short. And then some of them are really, really lengthy and have a hefty page count. But what actually brings me in the bulk of my income is totally unrelated to Roswell. Uh, when I was a kid, I really liked to watch Godzilla movies. Yeah. And I never got out of that. You know, it's, I think we all did. Yeah. I mean, yeah. everybody has a thing that they're into. Like, like you and I both know Jared Olive. He's into Batman. That's his right, thing. Right. You know, there's certain things from your childhood you don't ever let go of. You keep on collecting them. And for me, that was Godzilla. And uh, I had written a, a book for a publisher. I, I had my eye on this particular publisher and I tailored the book I wrote to, to what they would publish. And it's funny, I sent it off to him and I never got a response. And I let it sit for a few years and I finally decided to just self-publish it. Oh, wow. And I didn't want to self-publish, you know, because I'd already, I'd already worked with a publisher and I'd kind of gotten spoiled and I, I just didn't want to self-publish it. But I thought, well, I'll, uh, I'll self-publish it as an ebook just to get it out there and see what happens. And uh, I was so dumb when I was setting it up, I didn't even realize until I was midway through that I was setting up the print book. Cause I wasn't even going to do a print book. I didn't okay. even think there was a point. I thought I'd, I'll just do an ebook and you know, it's just the irony of life. Um, the print book that I made of that, it's just a guide and review book to the Godzilla and Japanese monster movies that sold incredibly well for me. Wow. And the ebook sells probably half of what the print book sold. So How I mean, cool for is that? yeah, people say it's all the ebooks now. It's really not from what I can tell. Mm -hmm. I get the bulk of my royalties from, from print copies, but yeah, so the book that I thought would do the least for me did the most, so I did another and another and 
So uh, let's talk a little bit about that specific book. Uh, first of all, make sure you mention the title so the listeners that yeah. might be interested, uh, the geeks like myself that enjoy all that. But um, also, uh, what's what's the subject? I, I know you hit the mm -hmm. quick touch, but obviously it's it's ringing a bell with uh, followers. Yeah, so it, uh, there's a, a decent amount of books just on Godzilla, but there's other Japanese monsters besides Godzilla. So that was what kind of set my review book apart was I, okay. I covered all of them not just Godzilla, because there's one that's really out there called Gamera, which is the uh -huh. turtle who can fly and just yeah, crazy yeah. stuff like that, and Ultraman. Uh, and what really became a hit was, uh, so typically how I, how I come up with my books is I write a book that I want to read that doesn't exist yet. Okay. And what I wanted was a book on the unmade uh, Godzilla movies that they wrote, and then they never made it to the point that they were shot. They were Interesting. Abandoned. Okay. And uh, a lot of other people wanted that book too. And I, you know, I'm the type, I wanted the experts to write that book because I wanted to read it. And I think I even pitched it to one of them and they weren't really interested. And I finally decided, well, I may not do a very good job of it, but I'll just do it myself. And I yeah. did. And that's the book that just really, really sells like crazy. How crazy More is that? More so just, than the guidebook. Just a yeah. passion project that mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you wanted to read. Yeah. How cool is that? Yeah. And it's the same with... Uh, my most, I mean, predominantly, we're probably going to have Roswell people listening to this. So I'll round it back to my next Roswell centric book. Same thing. Uh, whenever I would research Billy the Kid, I would come across a man named Ash Upson, and he was he was uh, the quintessential drunken journalist who traveled west from the east. Okay. And had he he was just your typical crazy wacky sidekick, and he had a lot of funny adventures just because frankly he was a drunk and he was or maybe i should call him a lush maybe okay. not a drunk I'll, I'll call him a lush and he just had this crazy crazy life and i was thinking wow i, I want to read the ash up some books so i started looking for it because i just took it for granted somebody had to write about him he's so interesting and then it turned out nobody did so wow i wrote that book about four years ago now and UNM press picked it up just recently and it'll supposedly if we get done editing it come out next spring so wow. 2021 so you're not uh this is something i like about you every time i talk to you you're a doer you've got stuff mm -hmm. in the works uh, you've got previous things uh you travel to uh cons and other things like that in order to promote your uh especially your godzilla stuff i know that yeah. that goes over well but there is a decent amount of Billy the Kid people mm -hmm. around the world, yeah. which is rather amazing. And most people don't know a lot of the history. It wasn't until I actually was exploring some of that with you years ago that I learned some of the things of how he was so related to Roswell, too, mm -hmm. which was pretty neat. What I love to tell the tourists that always blows their mind is that the man who killed Pat Garrett is related to the man who found the UFO debris. That is so cool. Yeah, that's uh, uh, history is one of those things that uh, is is not only valuable, but it just really is interesting to see how all these things run together. And I think we can learn a lot from it. Um, what have been uh, on that subject? What have been some of the things as you were digging through all this that that you learned about life or just mm. that you thought was interesting? Because, you know, when we study other people's lives, mm -hmm. there's some there's some cool things that come to come to light. Well, I used to think it was kind of silly when they said they teach us history so that history doesn't repeat itself, but history constantly does repeat itself no matter how much we teach kids history. I mean, you were talking about learning lessons about life. I've served on three different boards now in the past 10 years. I would say I've learned the most about life through the different organizations I've served with or served okay. on. More than the history I read, to, to be honest, I, I really got nothing on learning life lessons from Ash Upson, to be honest. Um, okay. But yeah, th I would say, yeah, indirectly becoming involved with those different organizations definitely learned a lot about life and, and leadership and things like that. Okay. Anything you want to share? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm putting you on the spot no. right there. Well, you touched on something I liked earlier. You said, I'm a doer, and I thank you. That's an honor. This is one of my pet peeves that I've seen in organizations is you've got people who they want to put their idea out there, but they don't want to work at it. They want you to do it. Yeah. I'm giving you my idea. You do it. 
Right. And the only time that's ever okay is if they are physically incapable of doing it. Like they're so elderly that they can't, they yeah. can't do it. That's fine. But like, if you are able-bodied, don't give me your idea and expect me to do it. I, or the rest of us, you know, if that's your idea, you need to work at that. Wow. You, know, you need to do it. That's, that's a big pet peeve that I have with just different people I've, I've observed in these organizations. So how do you, or, or I, maybe I should put it like this. What ways have you learned in helping someone through that uh, and or getting them to just be quiet mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if they're not willing to to step up? You know, because I, I know this, all of us that are business owners, leaders in the community, managers, whatever, uh, we face that on a regular yeah. basis. Okay. So I'm going to preface this again with I've been on three different boards, so you don't yeah. really know what I'm talking about or who. Sure. Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't need to play the sure. gossip game. Yeah. I'm just yeah. looking for oh, I know, uh, I know. tools I, I know. that can help. Yeah, so this is probably the biggest lesson I've learned is being a nice guy in the moment isn't always being a nice guy in the long run. Okay. So let's say someone that's a part of your organization has either, maybe they have a bad idea. It's not such a bad idea that you're all going to veto it because it's going to bring financial ruin upon you. Of course you're going to veto that. But like, let's say it's just, kind of a bad idea but you don't want to rock the boat you don't want to insult them so you kind of let their bad idea pass through just so you don't hurt their feelings and it turns out it was a bad idea and you do have kind of a cleanup because of that and some drama because of that and what i'm trying to say is it's not fun to be the bad guy and say no but if you don't sometimes you're going to pay the price for that wow okay and what's even worse i would say are just bad personalities Let's say someone nominates their friend to be on the board. And deep down, you know, they're probably not a good idea. And I'll say something else. You know, we all have friends that we only see their good side. Wow. Okay. You know, I mean, you might yeah. be unaware that your friend has a bad side or you just overlook it because they don't show you their bad side. But I mean, yeah. sometimes, you know, someone gets nominated to replace someone else who's leaving and like, you know, that's not a good idea. But... I say, if I speak out, I'm going to rock the boat. I'm going to make so-and-so feel bad. I don't want their friend here, but boy, howdy. I mean, some people you let them on, it's just, it's bad news. And it's, it, it's not bad in the beginning, but you know how they say people, you give them an inch, they take yeah. a mile. It just gets worse and worse as time goes on. And before you know it, you have a, a big, big mess. And then they will also nominate their friends to come into your organization. And again, nobody wants to say no. And you, so, I mean, that's what I'm trying to say. It's, it's no fun to be the bad guy and say no, but it's probably less hurtful for other people in the organization if you just speak up. So if I'm hearing you right, uh, and obviously this would apply to hiring and staff mm -hmm. people and all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff, be swift with your decision. Yeah. And if you have it in your gut, listen to your gut. Mm -hmm. Don't goof that up. Yeah, and ask around. I mean, talk to people you trust to, maybe it won't, get around that you've been asking about a person, but do your homework and actually yeah. what, what's the process called vetting them or venting them? What vetting. is it? Vet, vetting? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Vet, vet the people that are being nominated and just kind of ask, well, what, what kind of a person are they? Do they like to rock the boat? Are they, are they team players? What are they? Right. You know? So you've seen uh, both sides of that then mm -hmm. you've seen it where you, uh, cause I know you've been a uh, president of at least one of these boards, yeah. um, where you allowed something, thinking it was being kind, mm -hmm. but it bit you in the butt later. Absolutely, yeah. And, uh, but then the other side where you moved quickly and it saved? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, uh, I'd like to talk about, I, I will use names now because it's all good things. Uh, okay. Our current board president for the Historical Museum is Jane Anglin. Yeah. You know, former superintendent of the schools. And it's hilarious because your best leaders, they usually don't want to be the leader because they know how much work it's going to be, number one. <laughs> and two, they've been there, they've done that. It doesn't yeah. do anything for their ego. Like right. I can tell you, being president of the Historical Society Board for Jane Anglin, that's nothing. You know yeah. what I mean? It's She is there solely to serve the organization. It does nothing for her ego. And she was very reluctant to do it. You know, I'm, I hope she doesn't mind me saying that, but you know, she's busy. She's got things right. to do. But she was the perfect person for yeah, the she's job. She's another and she, big doer in our community, yep, too. Yep, she's a doer. Yeah. Um, and again, she doesn't do it for her ego. She does it to help. And um, that's the other unfortunate thing sometimes is people who want to be there so bad, they want that title. They want that title for them. They don't want that to help the organization. So yeah. 
that's just another sad irony of life is that the people who really don't want it a lot of times are the best ones for the job. Well, that makes sense because I've lived long enough, uh, just a few years ahead of you, but uh, not not your elder by any yeah. means. But I've I've done enough business to know that there's a lot of things you just you know what I'd rather not have to deal with that again. Yeah. Um, and that's good wisdom, good insight. Um, what other what other things have you picked up uh, since you've been able to sit around? The mm -hmm. privilege of what you've had with the boards you've been on is. Uh, You've had people from all walks of life, mm -hmm. um, all ages, all that kind of stuff. I'm sure you've picked up uh, some pretty cool things. You, you said that one of your big passions is leadership studies mm -hmm. and things like that. So let's let's talk on that. Obviously, that would spring from a lot of those experiences, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. So I think another really important thing that I've observed is uh, <clears throat> don't be a martyr within or, an organization. Like don't give so much of yourself that you can't give anymore and you're burnt out because then you're just useless. Okay. And also giving too much of yourself, whether that's to a, an organization or a person, you can also become resentful of it. You know, I don't, I don't want to give so much of my time to the museum that I get to where I hate it and I resent right. it. You know, I think that's important. Um, so uh, is that coming from things that you've observed or that you've experienced yourself? Uh, I'd say observed and okay. I, you know, I'm careful of. And uh, then there's other people who, this is the worst thing. They like to be a martyr. They want to say, oh, I give all my time. I have no time to myself. I'm so miserable. And it's like, if you really hated it, you wouldn't do it. Yeah. And you know it. And I, I really hate the fake martyrs who just act right. like they hate it, but they're they're there 24 seven. So obviously they like it. Um, but yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's the ones that are uh, just desperate for attention, huh? Mm -hmm. So um, let's see here. Uh, what other uh, leadership things? Because uh, I know that that's you were also a part of uh, uh, several things in our city related to to leadership over the years, and so I know that that's a that's a passion of yours. Yeah, yeah um, uh, leadership Roswell was fun. You know, that's okay. a that's a great experience. Um, no matter how wise you are, I mean, you, you could go through that class and not learn much, but you'll be guaranteed to learn something. And I, again, I was talking about if you're really old and really wise and think you, you just, you've learned all there is to learn. I still think you can probably learn some good nuggets from leadership roles. One, if you're young, like me, you'll learn a lot from it, you know? Yeah. And, um, it's not just uh, the leadership talks. It's just, you get to see how different businesses here in town work. You get to see behind the scenes at Leprino or Fletzy and just stuff that you wouldn't normally get to see. So it's a really neat experience. Nice. Um, I'm going to divert for just a moment. Since you travel and go to cons mm -hmm. and things like that, there's a unique set of subculture of America mm -hmm. that shows up at these things. Yeah. Got any cool stories? Hmm. I know I'm putting you on the spot. I don't mind being on the spot. Gosh, the problem with me is I have trouble with my, my recall in my brain anymore. Okay. I probably do have cool stories. We might have to circle back if I can think of any, but uh, nothing. What about people you've seen or met or um, odd characters that came through that? Yeah, definitely odd characters, but I wouldn't, I don't think I'd tell any of those stories. But okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I thought I'd give it a try. Because uh, that's always always fun. Uh, depending on what we work in, sometimes we meet uh, yeah. unique individuals. Something great will come to me after I leave, and I'll remember. But <laughs> just, this, okay, this is one thing that I do. I didn't think about when you've written this many books, and I'm not trying to be like, "Whoa, is me," and it's so awful. It's just I didn't realize how much of my hard drive space on my brain that would take up. You know, again, that's twenty books. It's my recall is just bad for interviews sometimes, and what's really bad is. If I'm doing a, a radio interview on a specific book. So when that book comes out, okay, well, like recently I did a show that's kind of similar to Coast to Coast AM. Okay. Because uh, last summer I wrote a book uh, about UFO sightings in the Old West. Yeah. Yeah. I, I never get bored. I have like probably five different projects open. Well, that was, a, that was going to be my next question. Okay. Um, and so perfect. Uh, let's talk about that. Anything that you can share about what's oh, coming? Yeah. yeah, I don't really keep any of my projects secret unless somebody asks me to and I'm collaborating with somebody else. But uh, my my other genre I get into is like cryptozoology, which is like Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster. Okay. And uh, I found that a lot of the old historical articles from the 1800s, uh, they have reports of things that are like Bigfoot or that they, you know, they talk huh. about lake monsters they saw. 
And so I've, I've been collecting a bunch of those older articles and just writing commentary about them, you know, like what are the pros and cons of this story being real or being a hoax? Because that's the really hard thing about uh, the golden age newspaper writers is they were instructed by their editors every once in a while to just make up a crazy, crazy story. And you really can't tell sometimes what's made up and what isn't. And so that, you know, it's kind of like being a cold case detective and just uh, trying to figure out if the witnesses in the story were real or and just, you know, what are the odds that the story actually happened? But so I'm doing a, quite a few of those. Um, wow. The latest one is called Cowboys and Saurians, which is an antiquated term for dinosaurs. OK. And it's all about newspaper reports where people claim that they shot, saw dinosaurs back in the Old West. The, the most wow. famous one is outside of Tombstone, Arizona. Two cowboys claim they shot a pterodactyl back in 1890. Interesting. And, you know, and then there's also, in addition to the weird creatures, there's UFOs in the Old West. And I, I do those with uh, my co-author, Noe Torres, who's from Edinburgh, Texas. He's a like a professional ufologist or UFOologist. That's what a ufologist is. Yeah. And uh, so I do those with him. We've got a whole series of those. So I, I have a bunch of those that I can work on if I'm bored working on my Godzilla books or one of my Roswell books. So again, you know, I've got those three different genres that's really cool and i just bounce back and forth you know if i don't have a deadline i'm going to work on whatever i'm excited about at the moment very much fun so let's talk about being an author and uh what do you do to uh, get your headspace that you need in order to be able to really take what's mm -hmm. been floating around up here and put it into into paper because i know a lot of people um, out there, uh, not just intrigued by that, but uh, there, there's even going to be listeners that have attempted to do uh, articles, even just simple articles and things, yeah. and they never can really get that, that process. What's your process? So I think, first of all, it's probably more fun to be a fiction writer, but it's probably also more challenging to write fiction. You know, I'm, I'm writing nonfiction, so I just look at the facts and I regurgitate them and write and present them in the way that I want to present them. Okay. So it's not too hard for me to get in a good headspace, so to speak. Um, I do think if you write fiction, though, especially like first person narrative fiction, I think that's kind of like being an actor with words because you're, yeah. you're playing a character. So I can definitely see needing to be in the right headspace for that. But for me, just so long as uh, I feel good and my, my brain's active and I've had a little bit of caffeine, I'm, I'm usually good to go. So, <laughs> so what, what is rest to you? What, what do you do? What, what, what speaks to your soul and gives you that, yeah. you know, that good place? Uh, Cause obviously you do great work. People are fans of it. They like it. Um, you've, you, you're very even keeled. You're very careful. You're, you're not crazy over the top on things yet. I know you have great passion for what you do. Um, you know, so many of us, we talk about all the mechanics of things, but I feel like a lot of times we miss is talking about what do we do so that we're good here so that we can do our other stuff. Yeah. Well, like I said, I never get bored and we're all different. I used to think my grandfather was crazy because my, okay. my grandfather liked to work. That was his hobby. Nice. Going to work was his hobby. He would go to work on Saturday and he'd go to work on Sunday if you'd let him. Nice. He liked to work. And, uh, I, I don't under, you know, his type of work was running the mobile home park that we owned for so many years. That yeah. was just what he enjoyed. Um, and I'm kind of the same way, except for my work as books and creating. So as long as I haven't worn my brain out, writing books is what Can I like to do. You find your happy place in doing mm -hmm. what you enjoy. I do. I do. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, I guess, I guess part of the, the, uh, the success of it is that you already enjoy the writing too. That's really cool. Uh, I love your story about how you kind of stumbled into it, not even realizing mm -hmm. that that's where you wanted to go. Well, and I, I stumbled into the board president thing, too, because I it wasn't like, oh, John is such a great leader. We'll make him president. This is what really happened. I think they thought it was cute that I was the youngest one there and nobody wanted to be vice president at our you know annual end of the year meeting. And one of the ladies was like, well, let's make John vice president. And really, as vice president, you don't do anything. Yeah, yeah. It's the easiest position you could have. I think they just thought it'd be fun to give me a title. Well, our, <coughs> our president endured a, a bad personal tragedy, and they had to step down. And I had to be president. Wow. You know? So it wasn't necessarily like I got elected. 
Um, but at the same time, nobody else wanted to step up and do it either. So, cause I, I did, I was like, Hey, you guys are all older than me. The one of y'all want to be president. And they're like, right. oh. <laughs> so that's how that happened. And, but I guess I wasn't too bad cause they, they reelected me. And then, uh, I think I served as many terms as you can serve legally as president. And then I had to take a break and then they elected me again. So I, you know, so tell me this, you touched on this. I want to go there a little bit further. How much do you consider work ethic a value as, uh, as part of your success? Because uh, you, you touched that just a little bit because of your example with your grandfather. Yeah. Well, it's like they say, if you enjoy what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. So I'm, I'm very fortunate. And actually, though, back when I used to actually do real labor, I actually enjoyed that job. Um, what it amounted to is my, my grandfather passed away. So it was eventually to where it was just me and my dad running this entire business ourselves, which was really too much for two people. Um, and thank God somebody came along and they bought it. But I mean, I, I enjoyed the work I did there pretty well. You know, it was just real basic stuff, trimming trees and mowing lawns. And I, I liked getting out and the physicality of it, but now I'm just ruined because all day long I do exactly what I want to do. And, um, um, again, it wasn't always like this because the royalties off of one book is nothing. Yeah. But now I've got 20 books. And then because we sold the business, my dad was nice enough to let me buy a rent house. So, I mean, I couldn't just write. That still wouldn't be enough to live on. But between okay. the rent house and the 20 books, it's enough. So so I'm very blessed. How cool to fortunate. be that close, though, to make it a full-time profession. Yeah. That's, that's pretty amazing. Um, and it's really encouraging to other people that want to want to go out and achieve in this. And that's kind of why I said it. I don't want anybody to think I actually live on my royalties because I would feel like I would give them false expectations, you know, from what they can expect. It's just, again, it's 20 books and then another yeah. income on the side. So well, when you do get to that point, we definitely need to have you back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. Okay. So with Stephen King, if you, you know, Stephen King, I believe gets a dollar a book as well, okay. but he sells a million copies. Therefore a million dollars, you know, right. I, I get a dollar a book, but you know, yeah. not in anywhere near a million copies. So if you like, uh, those of you listening, if you really like John, uh, get his stuff out there, make him some more money. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. no, seriously. Um, uh, so I don't forget, uh, we've got, we've got a lot of time left on this episode as we, as we talk and we'll explore some other things, but how do people get a chance to follow you? Uh, how do they find you online? What's, what's the way to get a, get in connection, uh, to find your, your books and your products and things like that. I think just the easiest thing is uh, the Amazon author page. If you just search John LeMay on Amazon, you'll eventually okay. find my author page and, and spell LeMay for them. Yes. It's uh, we say LeMay, but it really, if you, phonetically, it probably should be LeMay. It's L E M A Y. Okay. Yeah. So, and it's a, uh, and I'm a J O H N John. Perfect. But I do, I do have Facebook, but I, I have more of a personal Facebook and uh, I have an Instagram, but I've, it's really just Amazon. That's And what formats can people purchase? Obviously, you said that you've done well in print. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got some in ebook or are they all or how do you have that set up? I think about half of them are in ebook, but uh, I mean, if you want to kill two birds with one stone, you want to support me and support the historical museum or, or a local business. Doesn't have to be the museum, but uh, rather than ordering one of my books on Amazon that you know is here. And I mean, if it's a Roswell book, it's going to be available in Roswell. Okay. The Godzilla books aren't going to be sold in Roswell, but Roswell books will be in Roswell. So, you know, go to the historical museum. If you see a book you like, get it from them. I think the Roswell Museum and Art Center has them sometimes. Uh, Fat Man's Beef Jerky started carrying them. There's certain titles. So, I mean, you know, if you would be supporting a local business and you'd be supporting me. Okay. Nice. Do you do uh, guest appearances and stuff, you know, as an author, if, if people wanted that or can they reach out to you and, and uh, bring you on to talk about the subjects that you're knowledgeable in and stuff like that? The only thing I'm really able to talk at a fairly decent length about anymore is Roswell history because okay. I regurgitated it so many times I can remember. I mean, if you asked me to do a presentation on the Cowboys and Aliens book again, gosh, I'd have to actually study that one again, you know, um, did you tell them just go watch the movie? Yeah. <laughs> no, see, I'm this kidding. Is... That, that was, that was yeah, not a I good know. example, right? <laughs> now it seems like I can talk, but you and I talk fairly often. So this is natural. This is easy. Yeah. Um, I'm not really great at just getting in front of a crowd and just droning on for 20 minutes. That's really hard right. for me. I don't like that. 
Um, I'm willing to talk for about 10 minutes, you know, for Sir Tomeyer or Altrus or whoever invites okay. me. You know, I, I'll do that, but I don't like to do a real long lecture. Um, those are I, those just aren't fun for me anymore. But this, I like, I enjoy this. But So let's say uh, I, I didn't grow up in Roswell. I ran across the podcast because I'm curious mm -hmm. about all things Roswell. Uh, where should I start in finding your book series on the Roswell things? What, what would be the interesting path? So the uh, Images of America Roswell is basically Roswell history in cliff note form with lots of pictures. So that's just the okay. easiest way that you could probably learn Roswell history. And there are certainly more in-depth books out there, but I've, I've learned I don't really retain the whole book that I read. I just yeah. retain the high points. So, I mean, my book, that's a good book to start at because it's just the okay. high points of our history. And, you know, if you want to go deeper into different subjects, I did one on uh, Billy the Kid, which was Tall Tales and Half-Truths of Billy the Kid. Um, I was tired of all the books on Billy that search for the truth because okay. there's so many. So I thought it would be funny to just do the opposite. Nice do a book that's about every lie ever told about Billy the Kid. and Interesting. Yeah, so I, I, I don't like to regurgitate what someone else has already done if I can help yeah. it. Okay, thanks for allowing us to take a quick break. We had a light that was doing some funny stuff. Yeah. Uh, that's what happens when you do production. Uh, there's all kinds of things that can that can adjust and shape. But um, I did have a, a, a just an interesting question for our listeners. In all of your studies, can you give us two or three really neat tidbits about the history of Roswell that, uh, that that's just really cool to know? One thing that I picked up on, uh, you know, Pat Garrett, he's known pretty much exclusively for killing Billy the Kid, but he actually did a lot more. Um, he wasn't very well liked, but he had some good ideas. Um, it was really Pat's idea to irrigate the Pecos Valley, which most people don't know again because they just know him as the man who shot Billy the Kid. And uh, Pat was really geared to be the hero of that situation. And J.J. Uh, Hagerman, who was from, I believe, Colorado, he was a rich railroad magnate. Okay. He came in, took over the company, booted Pat Garrett out, and Hagerman gets all the credit. But Garrett got the ball rolling. I think wow. that's just an interesting thing that most people don't know. Uh, and Travis, I remember you yeah. telling me before you go on to another deal, He's instrumental into the whole growth and success of uh -huh. what we live in today. Yeah. And we were kind of talking about selfish egos earlier with titles and titles yeah. bolstering you. Well, here's a funny story. Travis County was kind of created in a way to bolster Pat's ego. He, uh, he wanted to be sheriff again, but if he was sheriff at that time period, he would have to be sheriff of all Lincoln County again. And it was huge. Okay. So he was talking to Captain Lee and John Chisholm. He's like, why don't we carve out our own little county here? Really? And then that was really his motivation was that I can get elected sheriff. And he actually lost uh, the election. Okay. Um, but I mean, that's just, again, kind of an example of egos. And so then, Chavis County was actually originally a part of Lincoln? Yes. And, and then to go into egos again, why we're named Chavis County is one of the territorial delegates. His name was Francisco Chavis. And they needed his vote. And I think that was part of flattery, if I remember right. Uh, because really, we should be Lee County because we had Captain Lee here. And Lee okay. County was named for our Captain Lee, probably yeah. the same deal. He probably had a hand in that county or something. And okay. they, they needed something from him. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm kind of I'm going off of my memory, which could be wrong. But Lee County is named after Captain Lee from Roswell. Okay. So that's just. Funny how all that works. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, politics and things just never change, huh? Yeah. <laughs> how funny. Well, um, tell me this before we wrap up uh, today. I really appreciate you and, and uh, giving us some insights to you as a writer and who you are. And, uh, and I thank you for celebrating our city the way you do. Um, it's, it's really cool. I've enjoyed it. I really have. What, uh, is there anything else when you were preparing to be on the show today that we didn't talk about or cover that you would enjoy talking on any, any subject? Actually, no, we actually, you're, you're a good host. We hit everything we, I, I would like to talk about. So wonderful. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, tell us, uh, again, we go to Amazon mm -hmm. in order to buy uh, physical or digital copies, yep. or if you happen to be in the Roswell area or live here, yeah. you can get Roswell lore books at Historical Society. And That's right. Okay. Yeah, Historical Society has just about everything I've ever written outside of the Godzilla books. 
Yeah. Anything New Mexico related, they've got. And uh, nice. like Fat Man's Beef Jerky has the new Cowboys and Aliens book, and so does the museum. And so. Okay. Very awesome. Well, thank you so much. I've um, enjoyed it. It's a pleasure to have you, and uh, we'll look forward to next time, then. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you. If you like today's program, subscribe to the format you are on, whether it be YouTube or a podcast channel. If you'd like to connect with me, go to donovanfulkerson.com. It has details about myself, our companies, and how to connect. If you're following our social media, my personal pages, well, it's just that. It has a lot of personal things, including spiritual content and the details that uh, I find interesting to me. Our social accounts for our businesses, obviously, is that. There will be products and day-to-day -day activities and things that relate to those specific companies. Thank you for connecting. Please share and get the word out. We'll see you next time.